What's cracking, guys? Omar Esop here, back with another video. This is going to be a little bit of a different video. You see, it's a conversation between two titans. We have Greg Doucette and Mike Israel talking about volume and intensity. How much volume is really necessary in order to grow, in order to get some gains? You see, Mike Israel reached out to me and said, Omar, will you host this conversation between myself and Greg Doucette on your channel? I said, absolutely. Greg Doucette recently started his YouTube channel. He's been posting training content. He is someone who is an accomplished bodybuilder and powerlifter. Mike Israel, you guys probably know from my channel. He has a PhD in sports physiology. He's also the co-founder of Renaissance Periodization. These two individuals are going to be having a conversation. I serve as the moderator in what you're about to see concerning, once again, like I said before, volume and intensity as it relates to training, as it relates to hypertrophy. And I think this is going to be illuminating for a lot of individuals. If you enjoy this conversation, check out their social media. I'm going to link it in the description. If you found it informative, hilarious, or like I said, potentially illuminating, like the video and leave a comment below. I'm not going to keep the intro long. Let's get the conversation started. Well, guys, welcome back to another video. This video is going to be a little bit different. We have two guests on the channel today. Today for a conversation all about volume, we have Greg Doucette, who is an accomplished bodybuilder and powerlifter. I'm going to let each of you introduce yourselves. And then we also have Mike Israel, who has a PhD in sports physiology and is co-founder of Renaissance Periodization. For those familiar with the channel, Mike has been on before. We collaborated previously on that Shaco project. I've heard Greg Doucette from my buddy Jeremy Hamilton that you're a monster power lifter and he had nothing but positive things to say about your strength. Um, so that's that's where I first heard of you and then recently you started YouTube you've been posting content. Greg why don't you introduce yourself because I'd rather have you you know go over your accolades. Okay so yeah. I've been a bodybuilder for like 25 years power lifter for the same amount of time. I've done like 70 power lifting meets and I've done 58 bodybuilding contests. Uh, 42 of the bodybuilding contests I did natural, so I trained natural for just over 20 years. Then I got into the performance enhancing side of things and did all the different supplements, abuse supplements, and now I'm more into the health aspect because I'm old, and so I've downsized, switched to classic physique, so I'm on HRT. And uh, yeah, so basically I, I'm a little bit diverse. I coach for a living. Um, I coach people on powerlifting and bodybuilding. Excellent. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, I mostly run a, a G for P site of myself. That's where I first heard of you. Yeah, I remember you were one of the guys that sent me a lot of money all the time for no reason. It was worth um, it. It was all worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> so, Dr. Mike Israel, I'm the chief sports scientist at Renaissance Periodization, a company I uh, helped co-found uh, about six years back. Um, I have a PhD in sport physiology and performance, which is the science of taking good athletes and making them better. I have worked uh, in a variety of uh, capacities in that regard. I've been a professor for a very long time, and I have been a uh, head uh, sport nutrition consultant for the U.S. Olympic training site in Johnson City, Tennessee for weightlifting and cycling. And I have trained myself uh, haphazardly for 21 years now, and I uh, trained, I used to compete in powerlifting with limited success. I now compete in bodybuilding with uh, also limited success. Uh, but I'm not so unjacked uh, and been training for a while. And also, I'm actually pretty decent at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. I'm a professional grappler and a purple belt uh, under uh, the Miglia Reese brothers and Josh Vogel in Balance, Philadelphia. Love it. Well, I think to start off this conversation, what we're going to do is I'll ask a question and then I might direct it to one individual and then there'll be a time to respond. I'm gonna give each of you as much time as necessary. I'd say probably for any answer, five minutes would be the max, but uh, obviously there'll be no interruptions. We're gonna have a civil conversation. For those that were unaware, recently there was just a few videos put out concerning volume, how much volume is too much. Uh, there's one I'm gonna link at the backstory in the description that Mike made a video, it was on a podcast. Uh, Mike, what is that podcast? I do wanna shout it out. It's uh, Yes, so it's the lifting dermatologist, uh, Stephen DeVos. Stephen and, DeVos. Uh, he's got a ton of great stuff. I would absolutely give his uh, YouTube uh, a visit. And he's got really awesome forums on Facebook uh, about like HRT and uh, hormone replacement and all this other stuff. He's a medical doctor, so that's the kind of guy you want to go to for that sort of thing. So big shout out to him for yep. uh, actually making uh, sort of the, 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 the back of this whole thing happen where yep. he sort of connected all this. So yeah. 
Definitely. So I'm going to also link uh, that video. I'm going to link his channel. Greg then made a follow up video talking all about volume. Before we go into this conversation about training, I think we should all agree on a few basics if we can. So I would want to have some general definitions. I'm going to open the floor to either of you to define what volume and intensity first mean. So Greg, perhaps if you want to start. Sure. Okay. Well, volume, basically like the amount of reps you're doing times the amount of sets or the amount of total amount of weight lifted in a workout, uh, just to keep it really simple and intensity, just how hard you're pushing yourself, how close to come to failure. And if you go beyond failure, that would be like my idea of intensity. Like how hard are you actually pushing yourself in the gym on any working set? Sure. Mike. Yeah, I would define volume just a tiny bit differently. So the concept Greg is defining is called mathematical volume. It's when you uh, do all the multiplication sets times reps times weight times distance. Um, and that's a very, very good concept. But I think a slightly one that does a little bit more for us in training is ta talking about the number of hard sets that you're doing. Uh, because the number of hard sets, uh, as you do you know, uh, anything from 5 to 30 reps roughly close to failure, uh, it's a roughly effective uh, as far as hypertrophy for all the rep ranges within there because as the you know weight goes up the per repetition stimulus for hypertrophy goes up but also you have fewer repetitions whereas if you're doing a sort of doing a set of five each one of those five reps stimulates a whole shitload of hypertrophy by itself but there's only five of them on the other hand if you do 30 reps each one of them doesn't stimulate a whole lot of hypertrophy but there's 30 of them you get the, all that addition together and it basically yields uh, roughly the same amount of hypertrophy magnitude so it's super easy to compare programs because we don't have to do all the math of like oh well you know how, how many reps and sets did you do we carry all the equations out we just do how, how many hard sets did you do you know for this session or for this body part for this week uh, and then on the intensity side I think that's a very good definition relative intensity or relative effort is a proximity to failure which can start for uh, effective training anywhere from like around four or five reps in reserve uh, all the way to uh, reps beyond failure which is somebody you know throws their their balls over your face and helps you on the bench press when you're not really doing it yourself at least you get you know to smell balls which is, is always nice it's one of the best benefits of lifting yeah so i think the follow-up question just uh, so we could all agree on the definition of volume and intensity let's just talk briefly about defining training to failure because some individuals would uh you know classify technical failure is what they're talking about so until you can no longer perform good repetitions or repetitions that are similar to everything prior to that so they would not include you know uh, major form breakdown or slowdown in repetitions or there's other individuals when they talk about training to failure it's absolute failure so they cannot do any more repetitions no matter what they would need to be assisted and so that's training to absolute f uh, uh, failure greg how would we define or how would you define training to failure when you talk about it in your videos i know nobody that talks about absolute failure to me it's all technical failure how many reps you can do till you can't do another good rep Okay. If you have to cheat to get the weight up, that's, to me, going beyond failure. If you have to have a spot or lift the weight, if you're just doing slow eccentrics at the end or if you're getting somebody to do force reps and going to absolute failure, like, I don't think that that's relevant. I don't think people think like that. I think when you train to failure, you go, you do every 10 reps of curls, you can't do 11, then you train to failure. I think it's really that simple. I don't think we need to discuss, like, absolute or technical. Just keep it simple. Sure. Mike? Yeah, it really is that simple. And I think even when people say they want to train beyond failure, which can be a good idea sometimes, four straps and, and stuff like that, I think the four straps still have to be with good technique because, you know, if you're, somebody's helping you with four straps with curls, yeah. whatever you're doing throughout there helping you still has to look like a curl. Some guys really get let that stuff get away from them. And they're like, I did 11 curls. Like, well, you did eight curls and you did three of something that makes no goddamn sense. <laughs> three lower back extensions. Uh, now, I, I yeah. do... I don't mean to correct you guys, and my uh, goal is going to be just to be the moderator asking the questions. But one thing I should say, because both of you have been in the Iron Game for quite some time, is you perhaps both have never or have not been to a university gym lately, where when I was in a university gym, they don't do, Greg, technical failure. Some of these cats, they go to absolute fail. I'm talking getting pinned. I When I went Life to university, I, yeah, I, I had to rescue at least three kids, just bar pinned to their chest quiet as a mouse because they don't want to embarrass because the girls are doing cardio upstairs you know and uh they're just absolutely pinned so it's 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 always funny who we're talking about i suppose where people uh we spoke off uh eric greg about the audience being 25 to 34 um that there is a whole classification of individuals that probably take training to failure too seriously or or the literal definition as opposed to our working definition that we have 
I think maybe that's why everyone keeps saying, well, you, you trained to failure, you're going to get hurt. And I'm like, why would you get hurt if you're using good form and you're not cheating and you're using strict mind, on, you know, time under tension training, controlling the reps, and you train hard to fail, you shouldn't get hurt. But, I mean, if they're thinking, well, you got to swing the weight up and curl and be a fool in the gym, well, yeah, that's going to be, you know, likely to get injured. But the way I train to failure, it's very controlled and methodical and my mind is focused on the muscle it's just it's a lot harder to train that way yeah. than to just swing the weight up when you're tired but you know i don't think it's dangerous to train failure sure okay and let's then maybe open the floor up now to the actual conversation on volume now that we've defined volume intensity and training to failure and we agree upon that um how do we determine optimal training volume for an individual greg i'll start with you and then i'll ask mike the same question Okay, well, I think it really depends on how often you're training each muscle. And, like, back in the old days, everyone seemed to do, like, one body part a week, like chest on Monday, arms on Tuesday, and legs, and so on. And I think nowadays the people are catching up and knowing that they should train each body part more than once a week. For example, twice a week, maybe even three times a week. So if you're doing, like, legs every Monday's leg day, you're going to have to do a lot more volume than if you split it up over, say, two different workouts. So – even myself, when I was younger, I've tried the seven-day split, the six-day, the five-day. Now I do a three-day split, so I train my whole body every three days, and then I repeat it again. So in the week, I'm training my whole body twice, but on any given day, I'm only doing half as much volume as I would have on that one day when I'm training one body part a week. And I find it's a lot better that way. You don't have to sit in the gym over and over again when you're exhausted and keep going. So by splitting up the, the workout into two, the volume can be a lot lower. Now, for beginners, they don't need a lot of volume at all. It's like they can look at the weights and grow. They literally can just walk in, do nothing almost, and grow. Like, if you've never trained before and you walk in and you could do a set of 20 with a weight on the bench press and you stop at five, you're going to grow because it's more stimulus than you've had prior. But if you're an advanced lifter like me with, you know, 34 years training experience, I can't just go in and train with a low amount of volume or a low amount of intensity. I have to work for it. So that's basically what I see. As you get more experience, you need more volume. Gotcha. And so that was kind of training frequency, saying that you uh, train the body parts two times a week. What then, uh, Greg, would be the working sets? Like, so uh, for an individual that's training two times a week, what would they do? What would be the rough range for, you know, their legs or their chest? Like, how, how then would it split down further from there? Well, everyone's different. Some body parts can handle more volume. So, for example, for myself, my shoulders, I feel like I can do 20 sets and just handle it more. But my legs, it's if I do four hard sets of hamstring curls, that is a lot for me. But other people, they don't, they don't, I don't know, they can handle more. So it's really hard to determine what body part can handle what volume. So what I do is I look at how much soreness are you experiencing? Are you getting delayed onset muscle soreness or are you recovering fine? You feel good? So when I get a, a client, I start coaching them. I, I get them to go really low on the intensity. I'm always like, look, don't train as hard as you think you need to train. Now, it sounds like the opposite advice of what I give, which is to train harder. But when I have somebody hire me and they're spending a lot of money, they're already the kind of person that trains hard. So I, I kind of have to hold them back. And then every, every week they can go harder and harder, more volume and more volume. But basically, as a general rule of thumb, I yeah. do about eight sets on average for a body part. Um, except like back, I'll do more. But I, but the back, I find it's like there's m different muscles in the back versus like quads, eight sets, or chest, eight sets. Yeah. I find that's about the right amount. Biceps, triceps, things like that. But for back, I'll do more. But that's about it. Eight sets twice a week. And I find that yeah. plenty. And I mean, I do train hard, so I don't need, you know, crazy amount of volume. Okay. Yeah. So it's eight sets per session, which adds up two times a week to about 16 sets. Yeah. Gotcha. That would be about average for most of my body parts with the exception of the back. And I do more for my shoulders. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the last question for you before we go on to Mike, uh, you said in a video and I want you to explain it because I'm honestly going to just butcher it. Um, a, a volume rule. It's a 10% uh, rule. Um, so you do like a, a certain weight and then you go 10% down. Can you explain that Greg? Like kind of the origins, the, how many exercises you do that for? Am I saying that correctly? Yeah. 
Yeah. So basically origin. So going back about 25 years to training <laughs> methods, exercise physiology, this pertained to basically anaerobic training. So it could have been swimming or like Mike you used to do uh, cycling coaching. I'm, I used to be a cyclist as well. So like let's take wattage. Like if you're doing uh, five sets of 500 watts for a minute with say two minutes rest between, if you can't put out the 500 watts, you've lost more than 10%. So you just take out the zero of any kind of a – if it's 500, take out the zero, 50, 500 minus 50, 450. If you can't do that, yeah. then you're done. So applying it to weightlifting, for example, or, or whatever, lifting weights, if I'm doing a set of uh, lat pulldowns and I'm using 100 pounds for sets of 10, and say your program says to do five sets of 10, if you can't do um, – the 10 reps and then you lower the weight to 90 and you still can't do the 10 reps then you've done too much like you're done that's it so rather than complete the five sets it's smarter to stop because then i feel like you're just overtraining. you probably push too hard but if you're on an easy program you could probably do five sets of 10 with no problem if you're keeping five reps in reserve um five sets of 10 is easy but i never train that way right. even on a deload week i don't train that deep so you know, for me, if I'm losing that much strength, I'm done. On a deadlift, I might do, say, 600 pounds for 10 reps. I do one to two sets max because I lose so much strength after a very hard set to failure that I'm going to lose 10% strength after doing two sets. Right. So I don't do five hard sets of deadlifts, five hard sets of squats, way too much, way too intense, yeah. way too much taxing on the body, and I just couldn't recover from that, even at my level of experience even with anabolic it's just too much last question then would you say that it kind of scales down where as you get stronger greg so an individual that maybe is doing 300 pounds on the deadlift for you know a set of 10 if that's their relative 80 percent of their one rep max they maybe uh, uh might be able to do three sets or four sets but as you get stronger and stronger so 500 pounds is now your 80 percent or 600 pounds and you're doing it for sets of 10 do you feel that or no what is it about the same consistent no it wouldn't it to me, strength is relative. Like 600 pounds for 10 is easy for me, but for someone else, six, 300 for 10 might be hard for them. Right. So it doesn't matter how much you're lifting. It's more how much experience do you have and how what percent of your one rep max is it, okay? So for me, I can lift like 90% of my one rep max for 15 reps on a deadlift. It's just weird that I have that muscular endurance, but I did like break the Guinness record of you know for sumo deadlift reps in a minute. So I have very good muscular endurance versus my strength isn't so good. I'm not really good at a one rep max. So it depends gotcha. on that, but it, it depends on your experience. But a novice lifter or somebody that joins the gym, they're not going to be pushing to failure like that. They're not going to go hard. They don't have the ability to recruit all those muscle fibers. They're just new to the sport, new to the exercise. Gotcha. I wouldn't advise that they train that hard. They need to learn the form first. Right. Yep. Uh, so, Mike, then, uh, let me ask you the same question. We'll open up with that. How do we determine optimal volume? Yeah, so you got to make sure that – so there's a volume range that gets you into sort of really good territory, and it's usually not an exact number. So we can talk about what the bottom end of that range is and what the top end of that range is. Mm -hmm. The bottom end of that range is something that we have termed a minimum effective volume. It's the least amount of volume you can do and actually make gains over time. And it's sort of pretty roughly detected as, for any specific muscle group you're training, something that gives you some semblance of a pump is probably good. Something that allows you to put a lot of tension through the fibers you want and notice that they are fatigued. Uh, so if you walk out of a session with no pump, and if you walk out of a session being like, bah, I felt like I did nothing to my biceps, it's unlikely that you're generating any growth. It would be great if you could grow like that. It would be super awesome. You could train all the time and grow all the time. And then lastly, uh, there's sort of jury still out on delayed onset muscle soreness. But if you're not experiencing any soreness at all, there's a good chance that you could probably do more volume and benefit. And if you're experiencing a crazy amount of soreness that lasts more than probably five or seven days and a soreness that overlaps into your next workout, then it's probably on the uh, top end of what you should be doing or maybe even over. So if you start your progressions in a mesocycle with something that gives you, you know, a mild pump, uh, a perception that you, you know, put some tension through the muscle and, and fatigue the local musculature considerably, and also something that maybe gets you at least a little bit sore. And it doesn't even have to be DOMS. Like later that day, you could be like, ah, you know, oof, my biceps, like something, something in there is definitely jiving. Then you're probably on that close to that area of minimum effective volume, at least if you have two out of three of those. And then the top end of what is uh, a good for hypertrophy is what you can recover from, and that's a very simple mathematical question of 
whatever rep strength you had in one session of, let's say, chest on Monday, uh, next Monday, or even the Thursday if you train twice a week, uh, are you recovered enough to at least match your normal strength levels? So for example, if you do 50 sets of bench on Monday, and uh, you used to be able to bench, you know, or let's say incline you have on Thursday, flat bench on Monday, normally you could incline 135 pounds per set of 10, max. Right? If you bench, you know, whatever, 50 sets on Monday, you come in on Thursday and you incline 135 for five and it falls on you, you're by definition not recovered in the sports science sense. Recovery means a return to, to usual performance. So you, if, you, if you try to say to yourself, yeah, 50 sets, that's going to make me jacked over time. Well, if you apply that over time, you're just going to get weaker and weaker and weaker, and then nothing will happen, and you'll probably lose muscle. So if the top end is can you do a certain workout, a certain high volume, and still recover enough to have another productive workout after that and after that and after that. So that's your maximum recoverable volume. There's a big range between those two, and most individuals that are intermediate, so beginners, as Greg pointed out, you know, they can do one set per session and probably get a really good amount of hypertrophy. Interestingly enough, though, beginners from one set will have a noticeable pump, will have a noticeable fatigue from tension, and probably will get a little bit sore. If you talk about somebody who's advanced, you know, one set's just not going to cut it, right? So this it's cool because it auto-regulates to the experience of the individual. Someone would say, well, but hold on, I've been training for years. Well, it's just going to take you more to get the tension perception, to get the soreness, and to get the um, uh, the pump that comes with, you know, with saying, okay, I'm for sure pumped. So beginners can do any anywhere between usually one and, oh, it depends on how you define beginner, one and four or five sets per session. And that can be anywhere between two and four sessions a week usually. Uh, and advanced individuals can do anywhere between three or four sets per session, all the way up to probably 12 plus, uh, depending on the muscle group, depending on genetics, so on and so forth. Uh, there has been uh, at least one uh, review of the literature by James Krieger that showed that in a bunch of studies on beginners and intermediates, uh, mostly intermediates, uh, right around eight repetitions, was, or sorry, right around eight sets uh, per session was pretty close to optimal. But that's not optimal when you start with a new arrangement of exercises uh, or you start with different rep ranges. So at the beginning of your mesocycle progression before you deload, you know, four or five, six weeks, you probably start at the lower end of that range. So if you're an intermediate, you know, three, four, five sets, get a little bit sore, get a little bit of a pump, and then add volume uh, to keep getting a little bit sore, keep getting a, a little bit of a pump. As you add volume, your pump's going to get better. Your soreness is going to probably increase, although not a ton because you're adding volume as you get used to things. Your tension perception sure as hell will increase. And then at some point, you simply won't be able to match your performance anymore when you're doing workouts that are like 10 sets per body part or per muscle group per session. At that point, when you can't match your performance two sessions in a row, you deload, wash away the fatigue, and then repeat the progression probably from the lower end going into the higher end. Gotcha. Okay, but now. I a question yeah. just about that, just a quick. Like, yeah. so basically, Mike, so if I was to do a, a mesocycle and started, are you suggesting that maybe I should do like a lower amount of, like, say me, I'm doing eight sets. Would I be better off to lower that to, say, four or five and then add the volume during each week? Or should I just decrease the intensity at the start and keep those eight sets? So if I'm doing eight sets now, would it be better on a, a new mesocycle to start with? less volume and then kind of work the volume up or just start at the same volume but just lower the intensity so it's probably some combination of both you're going to reduce the number of sets you do and you're going to get a further away from failure so at the beginning of a mesocycle you might train with three or four reps in reserve um and uh, you know maybe do four or five sets and then you slowly add in weight add in weight add in weight add in sets until to get you to match your performance or exceed it, you actually need to go all the way to failure in probably your last week or two, and that'll be at eight or nine sets or something like that. Although I will say more advanced individuals, their minimum effective volume goes up over time and their maximum recoverable stops going up after a while and the window starts to get really narrow. So for someone of your advancement, I would say that you might not get a lot out of anything less than six uh, working sets per session. So when you go down after deload, it might not be to four or five, it might be to six working sets per session, some reps shy of failure, and then work all the way up to nine in your last week, one more than you've been doing and get a really good overreaching effect that's going to grow your muscle while you deload, and then you come back and repeat the process. And would I, in fact, need to do the deload, or would the fact that I'm lowering from, say, eight sets to six and lowering, say, I'm doing nine to ten reps on it, like one shy rep of failure or failure or beyond failure, could I go from eight sets to six and then go to, say, holding back two to three reps? So, like... I'm on a deload right now because I'm in Mexico on vacation, and my deload is basically I'm going two reps shy of failure to maybe one rep shy of failure and doing about half the volume. That to me is my deload, but 
would I need a major deload or just is that enough? I don't think that's enough for almost anyone. I think that deloading by definition has to back away from that minimum effective to maximum recoverable window. Any adaptations uh, that are cumulative, so any kind of training that makes you better over time, also summates fatigue over time. So if your deload actually has to drop a meaningful, the optimal amount of fatigue, it needs to be non-stimulative, which means it needs to be way out of range of what you normally do so that you feel like kind of a piece of shit at the end of the week. Your training energy is back up to crazy. You're psychotic about training again, and you've dropped a lot of fatigue. I don't think backing off a little bit is a sustainable idea uh, in most cases. And is it mostly to, like, get the mind? Like, so when I use a deload, I, I get sick so often. I don't usually plan deloads because I get pneumonia often. I'm just, I've been always a sickly kid growing up, asthma. So usually I do a deload. I just get sick so often. I'm just like, okay, I'm taking a week off because I have pneumonia type thing or just going through the motions. But, like, I'm doing a deload on vacation. Is it to get my mind back into it? Because, like, I train so hard all the time that sometimes I just, like, I can't train to failure. I just can't. So to back well, up and hold back one or two reps, I feel like that's deload. Like it's so easy to go two reps shy of failure. To me, that's training so easy. Sure, I have I have two ideas about that. One is uh, I think that maybe one of the reasons that you get sick so often is that you don't purposefully deload. If you don't deload for long enough, you will get sick because your entire body's physiology starts to not be able to catch up recovery wise, and that makes you more likely to contract uh, infections and various other things. Your immune system absolutely dips at very, very high levels of fatigue. So perhaps if you proactively deloaded when you uh, when it was time to back off a little bit, maybe you wouldn't get as sick, and this has been a pretty well established in the literature, um, that you do get sick and deload anyway, it's good, it handles both things at the same time, not the best way to spend a deload. Uh, but I have another proposition. I think that when you no longer feel like training hard, uh, you should get on the YouTube, this is this guy named Greg Desat, and he yells at you to train harder. And I think maybe you should take his advice yeah. and just yell Stop a lot. Stop being more. a pussy, Greg. I gotta take yeah, his advice. Exactly. Gotta tell yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're yeah. you're contradicting yourself. You gotta yell well, at all times. Well, I did consider times. the the where you said about the the you know I'm training so hard in my immune system. I did consider that, but like for example, my twin brother he almost died of pneumonia twice, and we've been sickly our whole lives. Like I was a school teacher for 11 years, and I used to have to call in sick. Like I just got sick all the time, I, even as a kid. That's before training with weights. That's before taking antibiotics. Some people are like, you just get sick all the time because you're on that testosterone. You know what I mean? Like, so That's backwards. I don't think that is the case. I, I just believe that I've always been sick. I actually I think, get sick way less now than I used to. Yeah, I think if you have uh, an immune system that uh, is uh, relatively compromised at various times, I think that's an even better argument for you backing off on training more than you have been because – Omar might not get sick a whole lot. So if he overreaches on training, man, nothing happens. He just feels like shit for a while. But because you're so susceptible to being sick, perhaps it's even better advice for you to take it a little bit, uh, pedal off, uh, uh, you know, foot off the pedal a little bit more often proactively. There's also a lot of research nowadays that's been showing that if you push the pedal for, oh, roughly three quarters of the year, however much you want to split it up, let's say three weeks on, one week off, that one week off is not a week of regression. It's a week in which you drop a lot of fatigue that makes your other three weeks of training in the future better. And in addition to that, any muscle loss or fitness loss you may have had is completely counteracted by the repriming effect, the resensitization effect, and probably more than completely counteracted. So you, you get either equivalent gains or best gains. So they've, they have a couple studies where they have one group trained the entire time for like six months and another group take like two or three week breaks three times during that time. And I mean nothing, no training at all. It's worse than a deload. And at the end of the study, the two groups had the identical gains in muscularity and strength. So you could look at it like group number one trained really hard for no added benefit. Like somebody could ask you in week number five that you're at the gym grinding, even though you're super fatigued, be like, hey, what are you accomplishing right now? And you would have to honestly tell them if you were familiar with literature, like nothing. I'm a fucking idiot. I'm just here for my own. I don't know. I, mean, I just feel compelled. I'm just addicted to weights. So I think a lot of people, I mean, all of us, let's be honest, we're all addicted to lifting weights. Why sure. the fuck we do this so much? Um, and it just, uh, you know, have to pull away the crack pipe, so to speak, every now and again. So. I like just to make a point, I think Mike's information is really good. I think it applies more to someone like me, somebody who's really advanced and knows what they're doing, as opposed to the average guy that I see in the gym, that if they hit a bunch of deloads and stuff, when I look around, everyone's training on deload week. Nobody's actually training hard. Not no, But 95% of people are holding so far back that they're not getting gains. Um, Mike's information, I think, is really good, and it really applies to somebody like me. Yes. I just feel like the average guy in the gym, if he listens to Mike's advice, might 
back off or hold back too much? Do you think yeah. you agree, Mike? Like, so what do you think? Uh, one thing. We'll get to that. Yep, yep. I'll, uh, Mike, I'll let you respond. One thing I would want to propose to both of you, could it just be uh, context specific? So it depends upon where you're training and who you see, because Greg, um, you were in Toronto recently. And so I said, oh man, like check out my buddy, Jeremy. He has that gym Fortis West. Um, the gym that I train at is called Fortis Fitness. Sean Kelly is the owner of it and everyone in there because it's a strength gym, but they also have bodybuilders, physique competitors, strongman competitors. So it's, it's a gym where people have an intent to train. And what I see at gyms are individuals training really hard. And so from my perspective or also and then prior to that i came from the university where let's be honest so i i described it before you have the cardio machines on the second floor and a lot of the women would do the cardio machines and so you have all the guys down below and it was the perfect recipe for everyone to overextend so from my personal viewpoint of gyms that i've seen and gyms i belong to greg and you know toronto's a big uh, city so i try and go to the better facilities I see a lot of people training hard. So that, that's just my personal observation. Uh, and then I, I guess that informs the type of content you create. Uh, Mike, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to share that. No, no worries. So, Greg, I have a couple of questions for you from the, the earlier volume stuff and then the, the sort of training to failure stuff. Okay. Um, so the 10% rule you got from performance literature that relates to cycling not for cycling in particular, to anything anaerobic. So weightlifting in that 30, 40, 50, 60 second range or any kind of like, say you're doing this swimming or running or doing sets of repeated like anaerobic exercise with rest. So intervals of, or anything to do with like, you know, anything to do with that's hard, not like cardiovascular, not cardio, like not running 10K, but anything like say under a minute with rest between sets. Okay, and how do you know that that rule applies to hypertrophy training? Well, we don't technically know anything applies to anything, really. But, yeah, you know, I okay. don't know what you want me to say. How do we know? We don't know anything. How do we know that three sets is a good amount of sets? How do I know that eight sets? We can measure it in the laboratory. So what? they've done a bunch of studies on various numbers of sets, and they actually measure hypertrophy directly and uh, how much muscle people gain off a variety of instruments. And they can also measure how much upregulation of various hypertrophic pathways occurs directly after numerous sessions. So we do know some things better than we know others. I'm just curious about the 10% rule and uh, if that's been validated at all or suggested in hypertrophy training versus other sports. My only problem with the, the studies that have on like volume and intensity is they don't involve guys like me. They use the average person, which I'm sure it does apply. It's great for say an intermediate or a beginner. It's just, if you get to a certain point of advanced lifting and you look at like I don't know, the IBB pros or top built guys in the world. I don't find that it can apply to them. Even the studies using performance enhancing drugs, like the guys that say, well, you can grow muscle even on without training. If you take 600 milligrams of test, because they compared it. I'm like, you can't build muscle without training stimulus, but they say you can. But I'm like, if you carry a bag of groceries up a flight of stairs, it's a training stimulus. If you have, if you're, if you take steroids, and you're in a coma or in a wheelchair, your legs aren't gonna get bigger because there's no training stimulus. But if you even just walk up a hill, you, you, you're gonna grow muscle because you're doing something. So do you think most of your viewers on your channel are IFB pros and people who have been lifting for 20 years? Or do you think they're yeah. sort of beginner, advanced, uh, intermediate kind of guys? Definitely right. you're saying. So, so you, you recommend on your channel the 10% rule, which you say probably works well for advanced guys, but you recommend it to beginners and intermediates. And uh, yes, you just said that- um, because if you can't, if you're losing more than 10%, to me, that proves you're training hard. Most Why 10%? Most don't train hard. And it's like uh, Omar had suggested. I agree. He probably is right. I do likely have a bias because I'm training at a good life gym and I'm looking around and it's mostly like really average people, not really competitive or serious people. So it's definitely a bias on my end to see the average person that I see is not training hard. But if they're losing more than 10% of their strength, then they are training hard. So I think it's a good rule as a general thumb for the average person to know that they're getting weaker. They are pushing themselves because if they're not, if you can do five sets of five, or sorry, it's five sets of say 10 reps on the lat pull downs with 100 pounds, none of those sets were hard. Maybe the fifth one was potentially hard, but to me, it's almost like you've done a bunch of warm up sets. So mm -hmm. I like to suggest people to train harder only because perhaps of my bias of seeing that people aren't training hard enough which maybe it's wrong. It's biased towards who I see myself. So like, wouldn't a 20% rule make people train even harder than a 10% rule? 
it would maybe potentially get them to train too hard because if I lost 20% off my strength, I mean, the only way I would lose that much is if I'm resting not enough. Like if I only rest a minute after a hard set of deadlifts, then yeah, I'm going to be down 20%. But if I'm resting appropriately, that okay. 20%, that's going to be a lot. That's going to be too much training. Okay. So you could argue all day. Maybe it's That's why we're here. Or 12. <laughs> Like what percent do you think? I'm open to yeah. The, there's what I don't think the percent based rule has any validation. I think it has some interesting potential cursory benefits as as a, a regulator, but I don't think it has any research validation. And I think we should actually be just trying to optimize based on your body's responses and not on sort of when it gets tired. I think 10% is rather arbitrary. It's uh, misapplied from a completely different area of study. Uh, I think it's interesting, but I don't think it's something to go on, especially if you're mixing intermediates, began, adviners, uh, or intermediates beginners advanced. You know, for somebody like myself, the 10% rule would guarantee that on almost every exercise, I do only two working sets. Because like uh, I squatted I high, I, I, I did a. You should do more. But that's yeah. So all the so okay. So let me ask you this: You, you said you you train with eight sets, uh, you know, per session. But this ten percent rule for maybe you and maybe myself cuts out at two sets. Uh, where do you f get the remainder? Where do the other six sets come from? I rest a long time between sets, so I don't rest thirty seconds, sixty seconds, even two minutes. To me, two minutes or less is not resting long at all. My resting sets sets is probably averaging four minutes so i find that i get a lot more strength back because i rest longer so you do you do eight working sets of one exercise so I do one exercise for eight set it would be like okay i'm done on deadlifts now i'm going to do lat pull downs now i'm going to do seated rows now i'm going to do bent rows or whatever and then so once i can't you know i'm going to go to the next one so, so it, you, just, just to be clear yeah it's eight uh greg total working sets for that muscle group back and so it'd be two sets yeah, of, of sets deadlift of and then in the whole workout that's yeah it. got it so if you did like uh two sets of bent rows and uh the first set was you know whatever for 10 reps max and then the next set you cut to 90 percent uh as per your recommendation and you uh let's say you got 10 10 reps on the first set and you got nine reps on the second uh even after resting a, a quite some time then you know you say it's time to move on to another exercise you can either after rest that. a bit longer and try it again and then that's it or because if you're only resting say a minute and a half two minutes between maybe you need to rest three minutes that's sure. it. But let's say not, we rest yeah, an appropriate amount of time and let's say we rest like enough to where we know we're just dilly dallying and, and let's say we get to, to we get through two sets and now it's uh, so you would say it's time to move on to another exercise yes okay if we were to not move on to another exercise and still do barbell bent over rows and do another set, and let's say we got 10 reps on the first one, nine reps on the second, and then eight reps, is there something non-muscle growing about those eight reps? Uh, is there something, uh, you know, if we just still do the bent row, like why are we switching I, exercises if we can still do a lot of high quality reps? Well, you make a great point. And I think that what I would do personally, what I've done in the past is I've varied my rep ranges. So a lot of times I used to do like power bodybuilding approach. So I would do, uh, you know, like, Bed, deadlifts, really hard, really hard, one or two sets, move on to the next exercise, but my reps would vary. I might do a set of 20. I might do something completely different so that- But that I'm violates your set, but that, 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 so you do a set of 20 on another exercise, right? Not on the deadlifts. No, I would never, okay. it would be too well, much. To me, it's like, it's- I So why are you walking about, away from deadlifts? Because it's too much. I wouldn't be able to recover and do it the next workout. It would be overtraining is I guess- Based on the 10% rule. Overtraining based on the 10% rule, sure. To, okay, this is why I'm saying 10%. To give the average viewer an idea of yeah. when to stop or to know when to stop. The average viewer, not somebody who's a personal trainer and coach and has a science degree and understands this stuff in detail. It wouldn't apply to you. You already know what you're doing. The average person that doesn't have a science degree, hasn't gone to university, is in the gym going through the motions and needs to know, well, how do I know if I'm training hard? Well, if you've lost 10% of your strength, you're training hard enough that you could probably go home versus what you Well, not, not go home, you. right? Go to another exercise. Yeah, sure. But like yeah. what you're That's saying not the same thing, you have right? a range of, say, yeah. three to 10 rep sets, which is great, but like how do you know which three or 10? Like both of our suggestions are flawed in that you still don't know. You can't know, like you can't say, do six sets of 12 reps, RPE, this, and you're good. Like, no one knows what that exact amount is. So I'm just trying to give a suggestion of how you would know. You're also giving a yeah. suggestion. And so pick so the one you like. Mine is, seems to be based on 
proxy indicators for hypertrophy, the pump, perception of tension in the muscle, uh, the amount of fatigue and soreness and performance, yours seems to be based on the 10% number. And I've just, uh, you know, one of those might be more precise than the other, and one of those might auto-regulate better to an individual over time than the other. See, the average person, when you said what you just said, doesn't understand that. Like, when you're saying, do you feel the tension in the muscle? Like, the average person doesn't know, am I still feeling my biceps when I do the curl? Or, like, they don't know. But the average person isn't training hard enough. Now, so do you think the person, person that listens to your channel, do you think the person that listens to your channel is the average person? Or is that someone that sought you out because they know what you're talking about training and is probably knows a little bit about training and cares enough about it to figure out how their biceps work? I mean, they're watching 30 minute long YouTube videos. I don't know. I would say half of them are morons. Okay. But you seem to have a, uh, an interesting, very low opinion of your viewership. Do they I'm, know that? I'm, it's like this. I'm a moron with technology. You guys stop how hard it was for me to even figure out Skype. I know nothing. I admittedly am an idiot on certain things. I'm good at other things. I'm good with math. But like, I don't think the average person understands what really feeling sore is or judging how close to failure they've got or how many sets they should do. They don't know. They just, they want to know, but they don't. And the average person that watched my channel wants to be entertained. They don't want to be bored. They want to learn a little bit, but at the same time, they want to not be bored in what I'm saying. So I'm giving good information that will help them. And at the same time, you know, they, it's not hard to listen to. And I'm, oh, I'm trying to speak at about a grade nine level. So like when we're teaching the average adult, if you speak to them at like grade nine vocabulary and whatnot, they can usually grasp what you're saying. But if, you, if I try to make it a bit more advanced, it would be over the heads of most people, they wouldn't really understand what I'm doing. I try to simplify everything to make it just easy. You watch the video, you take home, you can go and do it in the gym. Now, folks, uh, just a quick question for both of you, actually. Kind of a tangent off of that. Uh, would you both agree, perhaps, that lifters in general aren't a monolith? Meaning that, you know, my experience, just anecdotal observations of who I see in my gym or it might represent a portion of the population. Greg, you go to Good Life and I know Good Life. So, you know, we have Good Life in Toronto where yeah. it, that's more, let's say, uh, the regular population who are not really fitness oriented. It's more a byproduct where they just want their wife to love them again or whatnot. They want to lose like, you know, 20 pounds. They're, they're on the, let's say in, on the dedication level, they're on the lower spectrum, but yes. can we, would we all agree here? Maybe that lifters aren't a monolith and there's varying degrees of dedication, the fitness IQ of people, like how much content they've been walking kind of maybe as Mike said, you know, someone watches your video, Greg, 30 minutes. That's probably not the person at your good life. At the same time, there are those people that maybe they're watching none of the, like none of them are watching this video right now that go to the gym that you go to that probably need some of the information you're saying. Would you guys just generally agree that lifters aren't a monolith? And so there's varying degrees of lifters and the needs that they need. Like some people, it, when it comes to intensity, they, they might need to train a little bit uh, more intensely. Other individuals definitely dedicate lifters that maybe watch uh, the channel or whatnot. They might need to dial it back. Would, would you guys agree? Just, I want to open it up. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would say that the kinds of lifters more likely to view Greg's content are the kinds that are already going to failure all the time, having the bench drop on them. They like to be yelled at. They like to go hardcore and super all out. And I think they're the kind of folks that could benefit maybe more from some more intelligent advice that tells them how hard to go, maybe not all the time maxing out and when to pull back and how to structure their programs in a way that is sustainable for long-term gains. Um, I think that people, it's almost like a preaching to the choir effect. The kind of people that'll stick around for a video when you yell at them, and tell them they're pussies and they need to train harder or other people that probably pride themselves on training pretty hard already and they sort of nod in agreement like yeah tell them greg these fucking clowns out here not training hard enough from my experience the kind of demographic that we're talking about a lot of college students and uh folks uh, out of you know in high school and just out of high school uh, they're the guys that are getting stapled with everything they're the guys round back pulling to failure all the time uh there's tons and tons of people that i've run into into the gym the kind of young male audience that goes on youtube are the kind of people that uh, want to bleed out of their eyeballs in training and they do it all the time and then when a gentleman like greg over here tells them that they're still not training harder then they're, they're sort of challenge accepted and they try to go harder still uh, i don't think that those folks benefit very much from going harder and i can actually uh, cite a couple of things one is that the direct research on failure training uh, for exactly that demographic, beginners and intermediates, young males, uh, shows that failure training is probably no more beneficial than uh, non-failure training. 
So that's a, a big whoopsie there, because if we're telling them to go harder, but the evidence says that going harder doesn't make a fucking difference, then why are we supplying all that extra fatigue? In addition to that, if your real job is to go harder, but you're maybe not the sharpest tool in the shed, and maybe you don't know a ton of really good technique, uh, and you let your ego get the best of you, and what you end up doing is technical failure turns into all-out life and death, Thanos versus the Avengers, war failure, and uh, Omer, did you smile because you were in that war yourself? You played a minor but important role. I, 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 I thought I thought I was, but they left my ass on the cutting room floor, Mike. It's fucked up, man. That's so <laughs> That's fucked funny, up. Yeah. So, you know, folks that are super training super to failure all the time, uh, they're actually risking the development of poor technique because your technique breaks down when you go to failure all the time, especially if you're not careful about it. After a while, you're learning really, really bad technique. Maybe folks that are starting out, uh, beginners and intermediates, uh, maybe they need to be sort of uh, really, really focusing on technique, consistency, showing up, doing enough work. I think it's pretty easy to do like one or two hard sets to failure, slap your fucking bros in the dick and asshole wherever you like to touch your friends after a hard session. You know, everyone's sweaty, the smell is in the air, and then go home and congratulate yourself. But I think a lot of people don't have what it takes to grind through multiple sets of very effective sets with really good technique. There's nothing sexy about that. There's nobody yelling at you. You gotta just do the right thing consistently. So if you teach people in an intermediate beginner stage that they should be having really, really good technique, eventually when they have demonstrated good technique, then you sort of start to push them a little bit closer to failure, a little closer to failure to really maximize the effect of each set. And then lastly, what you might focus on is like the mind-muscle connection, feeling their biceps and all that other stuff. I think that's a more advanced tactic. But I think that if we yell at people a bit too much that they're not training harder, those precise people that are watching that and are very, very open to that sort of thing, they might already be training pretty fucking hard. And maybe they would benefit more from programming insight, more from technical insight, uh, because I see those kinds of people at the gym all the time. I think Omar does as well, perhaps. And they're doing all kinds of hard, but not all kinds of smart. So... Uh, that's my sort of uh, view of the, the landscape there. Quick, I'm going to open the floor to you. I'm. Uh, this is the joke. Is in this conversation we discover that Greg basically needs to leave the crappy gym that he's in. Where do you live, man? Out of here in Canada. You don't have to say specifically, I'm but in like. Halifax. Oh, okay, yeah. Because you know, I was thinking. That makes sense. When you're saying, well, I'm just. I'm just kidding. Good life I train at. Yeah. I, yeah. I circulate them. Well, that's it's it's real interesting. Quick aside, man. Then I'm gonna open the floor, Greg, for you to respond, and that actually segues nice to our whole conversation of training to failure. But uh, you know, from traveling a little bit, this and that, Toronto's a pretty cool city because it's big. I understand you were there recently, so you have those gyms where the populations there's different intent or university gyms, kind of what Mike said. Versus, yeah, like the the sedentary uh, population that's just just going there to go through the motions and trying to you know occupy some time before a hockey night in Canada, you know. But uh, yeah, Omar, uh, Omar when you say said uh you're just trying to get their wives to love them again <laughs> that was both the truest and the most <laughs> fucked up thing i've ever heard can you imagine like the guy's doing curls he's like sherry's gonna love me again i swear to god if i just do two more reps she'll love me yeah yeah i had so uh, last tangent and then greg um when i used to so i trained people for a long period of time and there there are i noticed the difference in the populations young guys full testosterone want to get after it like failure is never a question for them there was a guy and i'm not going to say what his name was but he was a bank manager at a big uh downtown place in toronto and he literally told me that so like it's sad i said that but verbatim he said like man like honestly i've gotten sloppy and he looked at himself and he's like, how did it get this way? And he's like, I just want my wife to like love me again. Or like, look at me, look at me like she's attracted to me. It was like the realest shit a guy has ever did said to ever, me. Did you at least give him a hug? Like, yeah. <laughs> he, he did lose 30 pounds and he was ecstatic. So he... And he was rewarded with a hug. <laughs> by his wife. <laughs> but nothing more. Anyway, sorry, Greg, go on, man. Yeah, so I think that the clients that, that Mike would get are probably the most educated and the most... I guess the most determined to reach their goals optimally because he has the most education and he, that's what he does purely. Okay. For me, I started my YouTube channel literally to get clients to hire me for coaching. So I started putting out content that I would think that would lead to people hiring me. And it's definitely worked. I have probably 10 times the clients and I charge two to three times what I used to. So it's clearly working. And, I mean, I can only go by the feedback I'm getting, but I get four to 600 messages a day. And the messages are, the next time I go to the gym and I'm going to train, I'm going to think about working harder. I'm going to think about what I eat. And I'm going to think I don't need to eat this special boring food. I can eat French toast and I can eat popcorn 
and I can have a normal life and I can go to the movies and I can enjoy myself. Cause like I, I'm a, I'm a pro bodybuilder, but I live a normal life. Like I'm here on Mexico and I'm training, I'm doing an interview on the, you know, and it's a simple thing. And I think people get over wrapped into too much science behind training and just like go and work out enjoy yourself train a little bit harder if you're not training hard but there is that five percent of people who are definitely they're already training hard and when the clients write me in and i have a 35 question questionnaire they write everything they give me all their information i write them back and i'm like you need to back off you are one of the five percent that are just going and i have to hold them back and reel them in so i'm not like just everyone needs to train harder come on no, I'm not like that. I go you literally say that on your channel. The advice. So, okay? uh, Greg, so, what you're yeah, what you're saying, Greg, there's a difference between what you say on YouTube to a general audience or to attract attention, and then your actual coaching is what you're saying. If you saw my right. training plans, no. it's like so much focused on time under tension, strict training, just being involved in the set, leaving your ego at the door. Stop going crazy. Stop lifting too much weight. Everyone is training too freaking stupid. And I'm like, you need to just lower the weight. Everyone that hires me are like, wow, I had to lower all my weights by 30%. I feel so weak. I'm like, you're not weaker. You're training stricter. You haven't lost strength. You're tr now training appropriately. And the results are, wow, I'm getting so much more results now because I'm actually training hard the right way, not just banging out 10 reps in 10 seconds as fast as they could. It's 10 slower reps, not getting injured. So it's like, yeah, I think that, a lot of people misperce there's a misperception like i'm just out to insult everybody but if you see me in person it's different i just have no tact my girlfriend thinks i'm like what does she call it i forget something um i don't know i don't know she says i have some kind of something but anyway um yeah tourette's were you gonna say or not uh, Omar goes through all the psychiatric disorders he knows. Like, uh, let's see here. I just thought you like uh, uh, outbursting. Aspergers. Aspergers. That's what she says I have. And my twin. He's like a. She's like you're high functioning Aspergers. My twin is a genius, like IQ, like you know, redonkulous. You know, he's just he's smarter than me. But like, yeah. So that's what she says. I just spit it out. I've always spoken the truth. People hated me all the time. I've always spoken this way. And then I start a YouTube channel, and all of a sudden, people like it. And I'm like, man, five years ago, I said the same exact thing, and no one liked it. It's right. just so when you, weird how you do it on YouTube, and now it's all of a sudden it, it works. So when you talk to your clients, you have a, a much more intelligent, nuanced approach, focusing on the specifics, emphasizing technique, quality sessions, the feel, etc. But when you talk to YouTube, you dump all that shit and you just fucking yell at people. Am I understanding Perhaps. you correctly? Is that what you're saying? I would Interesting. Say so. okay. However, so I still tell it like it is. My clients sometimes will be like, why are you, why are you saying I'm 20% body fat? I thought it was, I'm like, because you're 20% body fat. I'm not, like, I don't, I don't hold back. I still tell it like it is. But, like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not exactly the do you, same. Do you think your clients get a slightly, do you think your clients get a slightly higher level of advice, a better, better kind of advice than the people on YouTube, or is it the same kind of advice? I don't know. YouTube is just like, I want people to hire me for coaching. Whatever, if they if they benefit from it, I think that my information on nutrition is better than my information on training, personally, because I think that I've done so many shows, and I've died, and I've been able to maintain a linear body fat percentage. I know a lot about nutrition and what works for people. I've coached so many people for so many years. The training, I think, I know a fair bit of what I'm doing. I don't have a PhD, but I do, I mean, I do have my master's degree in kinesiology, so it's not like I know nothing, but I do think that I'm even better suited for a diet on how to maintain a leaner physique. Um, I think Mike is more advanced in terms of his knowledge on training and definitely has more research than I do. You know, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. I can't. Well, I wouldn't know anything about diet. Every single thing. What's that? That was a deadpan joke. I said, I wouldn't know anything about dieting. <laughs> Oh, you probably do. I mean, do you say you competed in bodybuilding? Yes. Then you, I'm sure you know a lot. And if you have a PhD, you're obviously going to study and research, and you're going to care about your physique, and you're going to learn. Anyone that's really passionate about something that's smart is going to learn and learn the things they need to be the best they can be. 
Yeah, I, I, I think uh, the next segue, and I think what's interesting, hopefully at the end of the day, all of us as communicators, we want to try and further enhance the community with the knowledge, arm them with the proper tools necessary in order to make the best possible progress. And I think just circling back to the conversation, we kind of, what's interesting, organically, we've kind of talked about uh, a bunch of different things. Um, so we spoke a little bit about training to failure and, you know, we're really defining it as technical failure and we all agree on that. Um, yeah. I'm going to open it first to you, Greg, and then I'll ask Mike. Uh, so training to failure in light of what we talked about, um, is it optimal or is it conditionally beneficial? We're like in certain circumstances, you recommend it. When is training to failure good? Always, sometimes, never? Like what? what's your stance on that first? Okay, I think that no. I'll start by saying when is it not? So it's not good when you're a beginner, when you're just starting out, if you've just come back from injury, if you've had a layoff for a while, um, if you're starting a new program or a new exercise, or like when people hire me, they've been training a certain way for so long. And then I have this new thing and it's always way higher reps. So my average rep range would yeah. be 15 on a set. So most people who hire me are doing, I would say five to 10 reps and going fast. So their time under tension is usually 20 seconds or less. My average is going to be 30 plus seconds. So I'm like, you don't want to train to failure. So it's literally in the notes. Do not train to failure. Hold back. Leave three reps in the tank when you start. Do not push yourself to the limits. I am very specific on that because it's too much. That is for beginners, intermediates, or advanced. So if an IP pro bodybuilding super champ, 300 pound monster of strength hired me, I'm going to back them off and train in this way. So I think that's how you start. Now, when is it needed? Once you aren't sore anymore, if you haven't made any progress, like you've been six months and you haven't gained one pound of muscle, it's been six months, you haven't gained any strength, ask yourself, are you training hard? Are, like, are you pushing yourself? Because I see a lot of people who aren't, and they could benefit from that. The more years you have in training, the more results you're going to get. And it just depends. Are you recovering? You have to look at, are you, are you sore? Are you getting the, like the soreness for myself? If I, if I just changed my train completely and never trained to failure anymore, I would feel like maybe I have to do double the volume just to get the amount of like, cause you can go either hard or you can do a lot of volume. You can't do both. You can't do 20 sets to failure. So I, if I had to lower my volume, I'm going to just have to train completely differently and do like double the volume and hold back two or three reps. Why can't you do 20 sets to failure? I would be way overtrained. I'd have to go from training my whole body twice a week to doing like a bro split, doing it once a week. And it would be like, I'd only get 52 times to grow versus 104 by training twice a week. Um, I, you know, like the saying goes like stimulate, don't annihilate. I really do believe in that. I'm um, like, I, I see it like this. If you're here on the chart, and you train. As soon as you train, your strength, it goes right down. Then your body starts recovering. Hopefully it goes higher than that previous dome. And then you can train again. And you continue to get that slope. And then over time, you're going up. If you do it 104 times a year, I feel that's better than if you do it 52 times a year. You don't want to take a sledgehammer and break down the wall and then have to like repair it completely. You want to take a little hammer and tap the wall and then just put some cement over it and it'll heal up faster. Okay, that's my, that's my theory on training. I don't want to kill it. I want to do enough to damage it so that it can recover. When I go and train chest and three or four days later I train chest again, I have no soreness at all. I don't have any soreness in my legs, none. Three or four days, I never am sore when I'm training the next session. If I was, I'd be like, I trained too hard. So I, when, I, when I coach clients, I'm like, how sore were you the next workout? Are you still sore? How sore? Like, oh my God, I was what? back off dude you need to like slow it down you're training too hard well i was one rep shy of failure well then it's too much back it off start lower mike so uh the direct research on training to failure has shown that it's not uh clearly beneficial or possibly not beneficial at all but that research has also very very heavily implied that any set of training to failure gives you much more fatigue, uh, both local fatigue and systemic fatigue. So if we're doing three sets in a workout of, let's say, a uh, chest machine, chest press, and we have a choice to do them all out failure or not, two reps in reserve or one rep in reserve. If we do them with all out failure, we get a certain bit of growth out of that, plenty, 
and then we get a ton of fatigue because failure training is really fatiguing and that fatigue carries over to the next workout so on and so forth it lingers it's cumulative if we do the same three sets but with one or two reps shy of failure we get essentially statistically an undifferentiable amount of growth same growth but we get just a much less fatigue so if that's really the case, which it seems to be from all the science and certainly from all of my personal experience, if I can leverage that at all, which I think it counts for very little, but it's worth something, um, why are we going to failure all the time? Why is failure such a big goal? Why are we yelling at people to train harder? As sort of if we know they're training at least three reps in reserve, shouldn't we be yelling at them to train smarter? Because the harder just seems to give us more fatigue and not actually any better results. So, and this is this is research precisely on the beginners and intermediates uh, to whom you address on your channel. What do you think about that? Well, I definitely agree with you that the intermediates and beginners are gonna benefit from what you're saying. I think that they're not training that hard and they're probably training maybe some of them to three reps shy of failure, which would be some growth. And I agree with you that there's more uh, systemic, uh, like what's the word here? Fatigue. Uh, you're gonna be more fatigued by going to failure beyond than holding back a little bit. Um, but basically, the research, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know any research that's been done on like advanced people with 20 years living. Well, Greg, we're not talking I about mean, advanced people. We're talking about beginners and intermediates. Okay, so these are the people who you give advice to. I don't think that they do need to train for failure that hard. I don't think. I just think they need to train harder than they are on average. How do you know how hard they're training? Because, okay, this is my bias. Because I'm at Good Life and I'm looking around and I'm like, that guy could have done 10 more reps. His last rep was easier than my first rep. That's do you think the people at your Good Life, I, I got you. Do you think the people at your Good Life are representative of your YouTube audience? I mean, are they males so. 25 to 34 so. years old? Aren't they I mostly never... like housewives and people who just want them you know, to have love in their families again, as Omar said? <laughs> you no, know, Greg, you're, you're new also to YouTube, right? Uh, right you're you're new to youtube and so you're discovering uh it, has it been a year man like how long have you been on youtube i had six thousand subs uh six months ago and right. now i have one hundred and sixty-eight thousand. yeah so I, I'm, yeah i haven't actually you, you know you yeah. might be right i haven't actually sat there and thought who exactly are the people following me i just right. think it's the people like at good life sure the good life people come to me and say hey i like your channel i love watching you i watch your video so you might be right that maybe they are more advanced it's definitely possible you, you might be right. You, you know, you make a great point. Yeah. Uh, so talking, we talked about failure and it seems like there is, like I said, there is definitely common ground here where uh, when we spoke before, Greg, and you defined it, we uh, spoke about proper technique and how important is maintaining proper technique. And I think we agree across the board. It's very important. Um, will we say that's fair? Yes. Like, but like we don't Absolutely. need to, yeah, we, yeah, all of yes. us, we don't need to go into more detail. Cool. Um, would we agree that in general, beginners and intermediates training to failure can use the result in technique breakdown if we tell them to train to failure and thus not targeting the desired muscles? Do you think that's what happens? Um, like basically some of the difference between a beginner being told train to failure and them not really knowing what's up and then maybe an advanced lifter where, you know, having the 10 years, 15 years like you guys have been training a long time, you kind of know what that really means. So do you think that um, training to failure for beginners and intermediates can result in technique breakdown in proper form and not targeting the desired muscles yes absolutely but i i think it's important to understand that when i say train harder i don't mean try to copy what i do and train to failure and go all out or beyond failure when i say train harder and they say well how hard harder than last time well yeah. how many reps harder than your last time what i see and obviously there's a bias here is they're training Five reps plus from failure. Harder means one more rep closer to failure. That's harder. I'm not saying you have to kill yourself, go nuts, use sloppy form work. I'm just saying go a little bit harder, dude. You're like, you're just training like a complete pussy in the gym. Just work a little bit harder. So maybe that's coming across wrong. And I do think that looking back and how I'm saying harder, like people might get the wrong impression. And I'm saying, you're doing a set of 10, do 17 with that weight. I don't care. Get it up. You know, get your ass in the gym and train harder. I just mean just train harder. Just how hard? A little bit harder. It's like when I say eat less. I'm not saying don't eat. Put the fork down. You're full. Now stop eating. Stop getting three plates. Stop at two. I'm not saying starve yourself and be anorexic. Just like when I'm saying 
be a bit leaner in the offseason. I'm not people assume that every time I coach somebody, they think that I'm saying they should be five to six, seven percent body fat year round. I'm like, are you kidding? I'm not even that lean. Like, no, I'm just saying you don't need to be obese, you don't need to force feed to gain muscle. So that's kind of where I'm going. And I think that that's a great point you guys are bringing up right. that maybe my my intentions are just to train a little bit harder and it's coming across like freaking go insane in the gym. So that's well, you do be- yell a lot when you say it and you say it I over do. and over. I think that conveys insanity. And when I used they to sure do. Videos and no one watched them. And I yeah. would talk like this. And, you know, I right. think that you should do this. And no views. And all of sure. a sudden, I'm like, do so this. And then it's like, oh, wow. It's a bit of a shtick. So now, Greg, I, I just want to. works. I just want to say one thing. As you said, I'm not even that lean. You say that as I see you, my man, with some chest triations, delts popping out. I'm like, I just want to say for the record, I think you're very lean. Very well, lean. I mean, I'm, I'm, I just did a show like five weeks ago. Right. So I'm not at my – but it's been you're five right. weeks, and I've only gained like 2% body fat. Sure. So I don't force feed. I'm still – I still only eat like 3,000 calories a day. I don't like yeah. – you know. But I don't say people should be like as lean as me in the off season. I think 15% is really healthy. A lot of people think I make fun of fat people and I'm all against. I'm like, no, I just. But you do make fun of fat people. Not really. I just tell people what body fat they are. Like, Mike, if I say you're 22% body fat, you might think, well, that's an insult. But if if, if, if I think it's 22, I'm going to say it's 22. Weren't you on YouTube comparing Jeff Nippert's girlfriend to a pig? No, I wasn't comparing her. I said, she said she feels like a whale. That's literally what I said. Watch the video. You have to watch it. Where does the pig and come I, into play? I had a pet pig, a little baby baby pig, and my girlfriend had the pig. And then we were like, look at the pig, and we were doing the whole thing. And it was a video about Stephanie. And then all of a sudden, no, but getting back to Stephanie Buttermore, and then Jeff is all like, but Jeff is just, he hates me because I've done videos on Stephanie Buttermore's 10,000 calorie epic cheats and diet. Because you're talking that dances. shit, man. And then I said that Stephanie's obese. And they were so mad. But I'm going by the clinical definition of obesity being above Which 32%. is what? That's not the clinical definition of yes, obesity. Yes, it is. And it's 25% no. for men and it's 33% for women. And it's I do not. videos on my girlfriend and I say, Miss Obesity here, because my girlfriend was 38% body fat, but she looks great. And now she's 29s, and I'm like, look, she's not obese anymore. She's just a little bit overweight. Gents, it's uh, not like I'm making right. fun. I'm just calling it like it is. I will say, so I haven't seen that. Uh, to do research for this video, I watched the training and volume. Let's segue back to uh, the conversation that we're having. Um, I think it would probably be pertinent at this time to try and define, Mike, the stimulus to fatigue ratio that you spoke about in a previous video. You're, you're kind of explaining, you know, fatigue kind of accumulates more and more and it sort of gets uh, the benefits of training to failure are kind of geometric, but fatigue accumulates exponentially. Um, can you just define that stimulus to fatigue ratio for me, man? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, anytime you train, actually, can you hold on one sec? Yeah. God damn it. My Skype is on to some bullshit. <laughs> uh, okay. And I click on it and nothing happens. Um, yeah. I would be able to fix anything because I know nothing. <laughs> uh, oh, it's, oh, that's share screen. It's not full screen. So let me. Nope. Still does the same thing. Sorry, one sec, guys. I'm sorry, yep. Omar. You might have to cut out this part. Oh, no worries. Yeah. I, I, I'll put it this way. It's been about an hour. We'll probably chat for another 10, 15 minutes. Sure, no, sure. No, no one, one minds. Plus, I really yeah. want to go to the beach. My girlfriend's sure. like, sitting there waiting for sure. me. Sure. Yeah. So uh, stimulus uh, to fatigue ratio is – so anytime you go into the gym, you want to create a stimulus, and the stimulus is what causes muscle growth. So that's why we're in the gym. But unfortunately, every unit of stimulus comes with some unit of fatigue that you have to accept. Like deadlifts make you more jacked, but also they fuck you up. So uh, the thing is with, uh, you know, it's not actually a linear relationship at every relative intensity, or so RIR. It's not a, a linear relationship at every volume or for every individual. It's not that you always pay the same relative fatigue cost for the stimulus. So if you get one unit of stimulus, you get one unit of fatigue. If you get five units of stimulus, you get five units of fatigue. That's actually not true. Uh, stimulus and fatigue change slightly independently of one another. So some exercises might really beat you up, might really get you fatigued, but just don't get you all that more muscular. Thus, their fatigue would be high, but their stimulus wouldn't be so high. So the ratio of stimulus to fatigue would be suboptimal compared to other exercises. This is pertinent to failure training because training all the way to failure, in most cases, has a very bad stimulus to fatigue ratio because it's plenty stimulative. It's, it's very good for muscle growth, but the fatigue is exponentially higher. 
And thus, it just if you say like, hey, what are we doing today? We're, we're training all out to failure, and you do that over and over and over. Your the net balance of how much stimulus you're getting is uh, you know decent amount, but the fatigue you're getting is first of all cumulative, and second of all vast. So you're just going to have to deload more frequently. You have to back off more frequently. You're at a higher injury risk uh, more often. And fatigue also uh, is part of sort of a, a milieu of catabolic processes, including the secretion of cortisol. So if you have a very high level of fatigue, your cortisol levels are higher. Cortisol makes you, well, unfortunately, makes you probably fatter. And this certainly degrades your strength and muscularity and so on and so forth and it interferes with the training process and actually making you jacked. So the stimulus to fatigue ratio is kind of something to give some thought if you think training all the way to failure and training super hard, super hard, super hard is always a good idea. You gotta train hard enough for sure and you gotta train enough of that hard enough training. So your sets on average two reps in reserve and you just have to do enough sets to sum up enough stimulus. But usually if you do two reps in reserve set in most cases, doing more of those sets is a better stimulus and lower fatigue than doing just a few sets of training all the way to failure. So low volume, super high, to failure programs like HIT training, for example, uh, unfortunately, they don't seem to cause as much hypertrophy as they cause fatigue. So I think we have to be aware of that, and uh, it's a bit of a nuance uh, that is uh, sort of keeps us from being super committed to training to failure. It's one right. of the reasons I'm yeah. against HIT cardio for, for weight loss. Everyone's like, HIT cardio is the best for losing fat. I'm like, it's too much, it's too tough. If you're doing legs, and then you're gonna go and run or do bike intervals, HIT, I just think it's too much, you can't recover from it. And even in my own, I apply what he just said. I back off on, like back in the day when I could squat before hip surgeries and stuff, I had to stop squatting and deadlifting before a bodybuilding show because it just was too much. It was just putting me in the hole too far. I just couldn't recover. So I had to take that out so that I could get through the workouts, like doing the lap pull downs and stuff to grow the muscle because I just couldn't recover enough from doing the deadlifts and my hard workouts and trying to do cardio in a calorie deficit. It was just too much. So do you think the folks that uh, you're uh, telling to train harder and harder and harder, do you think they ever run into stimulus to fatigue ratio problems by going super close to failure? I would say 5%, just a guess, 5% of people, yes. I think for the most part, for most people in the gym, don't train hard enough and would never have to worry about a stimulus fatigue ratio. But I agree with everything you said, I do. I just don't think that most people train that hard. So you think most of your viewers train their average set, they have more than three or four reps in the tank with technical perfection left over. You think they're stopping I would think that far three short? Or four the average, but I think probably half of them, yes. Probably, yeah, probably the other half probably train within three to four reps of failure. But I think so they're training hard enough. Really, way back. I don't think that that's close enough to failure to get enough of the growth. I think. What would you say I, about I think the like one to two reps shy of failure is probably the good zone of training to get a lot of uh, stimulus for muscle growth without being overly taxing to put you in the hole that deep. And what fraction of your viewership do you think trains one to two reps from failure? I would say 10% as a guess, but I'm, I, I honestly, you know, this is a good point you're making because I haven't really sat and considered who exactly is my audience. I know that my average viewer is 25 to 34. The second biggest group is 44 to 50 something. Um, my smallest group is like 17 under, it's like 0.8%. Yeah. Um, and the, so it's mostly 24 to 50 something is mostly who I'm watching sure. me. Just, and you've experienced and people pretty- people who hire yeah. me, yeah. the average age is probably 45. Yeah. Just because they have to have the, the income to, you know, to right. be able to afford the coaching. So but most of my clients are on HRT, um, they're 50 pounds overweight, they wanna lose some weight. Five to 10% of my clients are what I would consider advanced level lifters that wanna compete in a bodybuilding show. 90 to 95%. Their goal is to lose 20 to 50 pounds and kind of like get to 15% body fat. Yeah, I was just going to say quick, sorry, Mike, that, yeah, so you're also saying, Greg, because you've experienced explosive growth recently with the channel, you're still kind of discovering who your demographic is because it's been so recent, this explosion, yeah? Yeah, I really yeah. hadn't thought, like, and it's such a great point. Like, I'm learning here as I'm talking to you guys. Like, that's really good points. Like, I never really sat and considered, like, who are these people? How hard are never thought of it just looked at the gym and said that must be who's following me because that's who says hi to me at the gym you know and i do get like you know the, the private messages saying you know i'm going to try to work out harder i went to too heavy low reps like most of the people right now i find they're doing too lower reps like most people that want to build muscle i think in their heads they think they need to go low rep like five reps build muscle and if you do sets of 15 that just tones that's for like girls or something and when i was younger my first, when I was 10 years old, I followed a wider split plant training program. It was set to six, six reps. 
I didn't know better. I'm 10 years old training with my dad. And then as I got older, I was like, geez, you do sets of 10? Isn't that too many to grow muscle? I didn't know. I was like 17 years old getting ready for a bodybuilding show. And as I got older, my reps kept going up and up, and the reps were slowing down. I got smarter. I left my ego at the door. I stopped caring about impressing everyone how much I could lift and more just like trying to get hypertrophy. Sorry, Mike. So uh, Jeff Nippert and, and, and almost all of his communications on YouTube and articles he's written and so on and so forth, he says that you know he trains and he recommends training between three reps in reserve uh, on uh, the easier side and actual technical failure on the harder side on occasion. So sort of roughly between there, we could say the average is, oh, one to two reps shy of failure. Um, you use Jeff Nippert as an example in your video of someone who doesn't train hard enough. Uh, doesn't, yeah, so doesn't the research say that an average of one to two reps shy of failure is hard enough and might even be optimal? If Jeff trained one to two reps of failure, I would absolutely make a video saying, I was totally wrong. Jeff trains hard. He does. I was an idiot. I'm a moron. But unfortunately, I've never watched Jeff do a set of deadlifts within five reps of failure. Ever. But so he's deadlifts like, are not the. Deadlifts, four or five mm -hmm. or five. I'm well, like, so that's when he's. Up, yeah, that's when he's powerlifting, though, right? Because he also he also lifts for, for strength. And, you know, you typically don't go to failure in, in powerlifting because that leads to all sorts of really nasty yeah, stimulus I don't to understand fatigue. That. You could maybe explain that. Like, when I coach powerlifting, we all train to failure every single time. The yeah, that's are just. High, though. And it's sure. Only one hard set. Yeah, that's just. I, I would say that's not an optimal way to coach powerlifters. I think powerlifting should be I've done something. People to be like all-time world record holders. Well, I am an all-time world record holder. Sure, you have like, excellent genetics. Just great genetics. I mean, it, it is probably is mostly that. I would say that somebody like Chad Wesley Smith or Max Ada, who train uh, with reps and reserve, have ten times the number of world record holders that most anyone well, has. I and, people, but that is. I mean, it's yeah. true. Who knows? They're, Everything they're just, seems to be able to work, but I like my technique of I, I go for <laughs> hypertrophy first, and then I go for strength. We only do low reps when peaking for me. So, like, I'm coaching a guy right now. It's eight plus all the time. Now, so, so when, yeah. One, one thing, Mike, sorry, uh, buddy, is uh, I was going to say that uh, what both of you might not be aware of, just quickly, in defense, I'm coming to defense of, of my boy Jeff, who I like, and I think he has excellent content. Uh, I know he has – so he's actually a former – world record uh not world sorry canadian record holder on in powerlifting in the ipf uh greg junior? but he but uh i th i think he was a junior but no but what i was going to say is that i know I, I don't know how transparent jeff has been about this and you know I, maybe I'll, I'll cut this but i know he had you know just uh, some setbacks like injury setbacks so in particular when we see him on the uh deadlift and on the squad the rp might seem lower but on the bench press and movements that he's able to push like i trained with him in toronto he does push the intensity and we were training you know to let's say um uh, like an rp seven eight uh two reps three reps uh left in the tank is what we were doing but i think i think if you cited the deadlift i'm not sure who did that that probably he's uh, keeping overall the intensity lower due to injuries just a quick aside. Yeah. So Jeff, when he trains for hypertrophy, trains from three to zero reps in the tank. And what we're talking about is hypertrophy. Strength is a okay. totally different discussion. Sure. Uh, so, but thank you uh, for that insight, Omar. I actually didn't know that. So, you know, and Jeff has plenty of videos of himself training. And, uh, you know, some folks have actually trained with Jeff. And he, he does train between three and zero reps in reserve on most things. Perhaps not a, a couple of videos where he's demonstrating powerlifting technique or intentionally hitting a sub- uh, a submaximal PR. Um, so, you know, based on that information, I mean, Greg, would you still say that Jeff doesn't train hard enough? Well, first off, I love Jeff's content. He's probably my second favorite YouTuber after Jeff Cavalier, to be honest. He doesn't like me, obviously, but I still like his content and I've learned a lot from his videos. Yeah, but you I think he's a pussy. That, I think he trains like a pussy. Doesn't mean I don't like but him. How do you know that? You, you like off one like deadlift pussy, video? I. I don't judge a person by how hard they train. I you just judge them by one guy. deadlift. I like him. What you're he saying. has good content, but he trains like a pussy. Jeff how do you know be that? Way better. You you if saw like Jeff one deadlift harder, video of his. Like honestly, if Jeff Jeff is a natural bodybuilding champion, I did a natty or not video. I said he's a hundred percent natural. I defend him a lot. I he doesn't like me because I called out his girlfriend on making ob obesity videos, like promoting eating and binging, and and I just I'm not for that. But that's besides the point. But Jeff, yeah. I think he says to hold back a little bit. And when you tell people to hold back a little bit, they hold back more than they than they think. Because there are research studies saying, like, how hard do you think you train? Oh, yeah, I train, like, you know, two or three reps in reserve. 
and then they watch them and they do five or six extra reps. So most people, if you say, hold back, keep two to three reps in reserve, they're going to hold five back. Because if you say, I use the analogy of for $1,000 a rep, how many more would you get? Some people say, gun to your head. $1,000 a rep, I'll be like, how hard did you go? Oh, it was really hard. It's like one rep shot. Of it. So for 1000 bucks a rep, how many can you get? Well, probably like three or four more. I'm like, you just said yeah. one more rep. I'm yeah. like, for 1000 bucks, you get three. No. Yeah. So I think that Jeff is probably right if you actually train like to the letter what he says, which is say two to three reps in reserve. But people that do that are, are keeping five in reserve. So I so, say so that's beginners. Yeah, beginners and intermediates do that, but advanced people have been shown to rate themselves accurately and sometimes overrate themselves. Jeff is is absolutely an advanced lifter. Uh, yeah. You still don't think he can gauge his failure training accurately by never having trained with him in real life? You've I seen a couple sure deadlift videos. I because I watched a video of him with Eric Berg, and they were doing leg presses, and they said, yeah, we're doing this many sets. It was a video when he said, we're going to train our whole bodies five days a week, and I said, made a video saying, don't train like Jeff Nippert, clickbait, because he was training five, his whole body five times a week, which I disagree with. And he was doing the leg press, and he said, yep, how many reps in reserve is that? And he's like, two. And then Eric looked at him and was like, really? He was like, well, maybe more like four. Oh, Eric Helms, not Eric Berg. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, I'm not good with names. I remember, if you watch any of my videos, I mispronounce so, all the right. names. I, so from, I from one leg press set on YouTube, you have painted a broad brush over his entire training approach. No, the second one, him deadlifting 405 for five. and said Which was, was in a PR. powerlifting and context, like, that and was he's a hurt. Warm -up set, but it was a PR. He's like, I just said a PR. Co a a comeback. Record, and now, five reps at least shy of failure. Folks. If I said, Jeff, how yeah. many reps could you have got for $1,000 a rep more? He would have gotten at least five more. Now, folks, one thing, I don't want this to go off too much on a tangent. I do think at this time, probably uh, getting closer to closing remarks is an hour and 20 minutes. I think we've had overall. Oh, yeah, an hour and 26 minutes. Yeah, a productive conversation. One thing I also want to note just uh, for YouTubers and the types of content on occasion, I'm not sure of those particular videos, but I know I've been not guilty of this, but when you're filming content, and you're trying to inform individuals. Sometimes when you want to go through different movements, you might uh, film a particular workout that's not indicative of your overall training. Right. Um, in particular, when you're aware of your audience, where some people, you know, I I've changed my content. I've been on YouTube now for a decade where you see individuals pushing and like, I've I've noticed. So what I could say for my audience uh, on occasions, uh, some individuals that are pushing themselves too hard. Right. Because I would uh, say certain things. And so you get that instantaneous feedback kind of seeing them. And so Jeff might be aware of that fact. And so the movements that he shows or the intensity that he shows is closer in terms of the technique that he desires from his audience as opposed to maybe what he might train personally because there is that cognitive disconnect that can occur where someone here is like whatever uh you know uh, uh train train less hard and they're actually training really hard and think well, wait a second why do i need to hear that so i think it's always context dependent i do at this time because we've had a long conversation i think there was definitely some common ground for you guys maybe to say closing remarks i know uh, uh greg you wanted to talk directly to kind of the audience like just uh, what you feel is holding most people back this is your opportunity now to say maybe a closing remark about anything that you've said before anything you want to circle back to clarify or talk right to the people so first uh greg i'll give you the opportunity and then mike i'll i'll give you an opportunity okay so after hearing you know you guys advise me on what the, my audience might be like i want to point out only train harder if you're not actually training very hard <laughs> so I don't know what percentage of the people that are watching this are already <coughs> actually training hard. I don't think you need to train failure all the time. Unless you're, you know, there's certain times you're super advanced, you're not making progress and so on. Look at your training and look, are you training hard enough? For the most part, I do think that most people don't train in a hard enough. That's in cycling all the time. It's in weightlifting. It's in almost all sports throughout my whole life. I always trained harder than everybody. Everybody. Every single person I did any sport with, swimming, whatever, everyone holds back so much. It doesn't matter what sport. People don't push themselves. I find that people are, like, lazy. It's in school. I studied harder than everybody. I was like, you only studied an hour for the exam. I studied 40 hours. Like, it's just people don't try hard enough. Relationships. People don't communicate. it. It's everything in life. People don't push themselves hard enough. So, yeah, there's going to be a certain percentage of you that are. It doesn't apply to you. If you're training hard, you know who you are. If you're not, ask yourself, am I training hard enough? 
watch Mike's information, watch mine, my, watch Jeff, watch everybody's information and then make your own decision on what you believe in. Because I'm not for everyone and neither is Mike and neither is Jeff. So pick whoever you kind of like associate with the more or respect the more or whatever, whatever you believe in the more and follow what they say. Now, I don't think you should kill yourself. Don't use bad form. But I do still stand by my statement that I think most people need to train harder. But not if you're already training hard. That's yeah. it. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, I'd say uh, I would not advise people to listen to who resonates with them. I think that if you're very interested in becoming as good at being jacked and being strong as possible, you're going to realize that calm thought and logic is going to take you the furthest possible and once you have devised a rational plan you will be able to execute on that with any amount of effort that is required from you because you're the kind of person that really wants to get jacked and you want to do what it takes so instead of perusing youtube and looking for folks that are entertaining and you can resonate with perhaps look for the folks that make the most sense and once you can understand training from a logical perspective and know what the targets are to hit for each day session workout week so on and so forth then you can have your absolute best results if you are willing to work hard. And if you're not willing to work hard enough, you're probably not willing to click on YouTube videos to talk about working hard enough. So it's a self-solving problem. Well, listen, I want to thank both of you for coming on to the channel. I'm going to link in particular, Greg, Mike, I'm linking none of my stuff there. So your YouTube channel, uh, Greg, I'll make sure I link also the Instagram, Mike, your Instagram. I want to thank both of you for taking the time out of your day. I understand, Greg, once again, you're on vacation in Mexico. I hope you enjoy yourself. Um, yeah, and if uh, and if individuals enjoyed this video, go ahead, leave it a like, leave a comment with your thoughts below. I'll do my best to respond and we'll see everyone in that next video. Peace. Eat your vegetables, eat your vegetables, eat your fucking vegetables.